Welcome back to another episode of Domains 21, where I have, this is a personal interest story for me. I've been dying to hear more about the open online course Anth 101, and I have two of the three creators here, Mike Wesh, Tom Woodward, and the other one who can't be with us, Brian Klatsky. Is that right that I pr pronounce it? Klatsky, Klatsky, yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to um, ask you both, what is Anth 101 and how did it get started? Well, I, a good way to start would actually be with Ryan Klataski, who's not here. Uh, back in 2014, he started teaching online for us. And our entire faculty was super skeptical about the idea that you could teach anthropology online. And then we started seeing his teaching evaluations, which were not just good, you know, not just like, not, it wasn't just the numbers that were coming through. It was these like long essays from students saying how much it changed their life. And so we started peeking in like, Ryan, what are you doing? And, and he had set up, you know, ways to get people out in the world. And I think that was the key. He had two driving principles. He saw, for one, he had this really diverse group of students who were coming from all walks of life. There was, you know, taxi drivers and ex-military and just this really rich collection of people. And he thought, okay, how do I make anthropology relevant to all of these people? And then the second piece of that was he wanted to put it out in the world. So it wasn't that it was online. It was that, you know, if you're driving a taxi in, in Cincinnati, maybe you could show us what that looks like and do a little ethnography, uh, you know, and, sh and share that with us through video. So uh, that, that was the original insight. And then a few years later, I had to teach online and Ryan and I got together for the summer. We invited Tom in and we just started kind of building the best of both of our classes together with this idea of, of, of adding to those two first principles, anthropology for everyone, and then getting it out in the world, we added this third principle, which is basically that you can't just think your way into a new way of living. You have to live your way into a new way of thinking. And that meant we wanted to build a set of challenges that got people out into the world actually practicing basic anthropology. So that's where it started. And Tom came and joined us uh, for just a few days in the summer, but we were in touch that whole summer. Uh, and then for a couple of years after that, just reiterating and reiterating. How did the design of the site reinforce the kind of philosophy underpinning it, right? You have to be out doing this to make it make sense. Yeah, we, we kind of championed like student content from the beginning. So uh, we tried to build websites that could show that student content. So they go out into the world, do something, and then that student, student content would be showcased. Um, so maybe Tom could talk more about that. Yeah, and I think one of the attempts certainly was to get the technology out of the way as much as possible, uh, both in terms of just dealing with the scale, the number of students going through, and just making life as simple and positive as possible for them. So a lot of times, you know, different things get in the way when you're trying to submit content or show things, but the evidence of them doing things contextualized by the frameworks and the challenges was what this website tried to do. So, and it tried to do it as simply as possible for those students using a variety of different things as the site evolved. So we started out trying to make everything happen in the site and make it simply happen. And then we moved to Instagram and tried to bring the things in. And now, uh, based on a conversation just a minute ago, it sounds like maybe we're coming full circle and starting to change where where that might happen and where it might show up. I was yeah. fascinated by the way in which you both not only built it on WordPress, and it was a bit of a heavier site, right? And you were doing a lot with it. And then you really streamlined that by offloading almost all of the heavy lifting of sharing challenges. And we could talk a little bit about the structure of the site to Instagram. And as you just mentioned, Tom, there's been a, a further evolution. And so like thinking specifically about how the infrastructure was both fully open source and home built, then outsourced to Instagram, and now maybe a rethinking of that with other with other infrastructures and why. Yeah, maybe we should share like some of the breaking points for us. Um, so we built a site completely inside WordPress and there were a lot of advantage to that. Uh, in terms of like control and how things appeared on the site, we were able to make things look exactly like we wanted them to look. Um, we started having trouble with 
some some sort of hack and maybe Tom could explain that. So we started getting heavy traffic because of like, was it a bunch of registrations that weren't real or what was going on there? Uh, yeah, I think that was one of the problems at one point was we needed to get some some spam registrants out because you got popular, but the site <laughs> got out there and then, you know, you get kind of besieged by things. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the issues. The other issue was uh, having due dates, you know, like we had several faculty using the site and it seems that almost all faculty were assigning things due at Sunday on Sunday night. <laughs> and so we'd have this rush on Sunday night and it was just hard to keep up with on the server side and it was going to be very expensive. And so we started thinking about how we could offload and we, and so we then moved to Instagram and we, we found um, some ways to bring those Instagram posts into the WordPress site basically instantly. Uh, we used plugins as well as some, uh, some Tom magic <laughs> and all that was working really well, but then it kept breaking because Instagram, I don't think really likes to have their stuff, uh, shown on other sites. And so, so Instagram basically kept breaking it on us. And so that became a bit of a headache as, as well. Yeah. That's trouble with relying on kind of the external APIs, particularly Instagram with Facebook's acquisition is they, kept pulling things back and, and breaking and breaking quite intentionally. Yeah. Well, how did that like, so maybe it would be interesting to think about the move to, to designing it, building it homegrown, going out to Instagram, right? Running into the problems with Instagram, not only around the technology, but often probably around, you know, students are using Instagram for a whole variety of things often not educational or often fraught with social or personal meaning. And did that start to create issues? Were there issues there that made you rethink, okay, maybe Instagram isn't the best platform. What else? Well, so some students uh, struggled with, you know, how do you, how do you do this? And uh, in particular, they were really worried about their brand, you might say on Instagram. So they started creating Finstas, which worked really well. Um, a couple issues we ran into, one was there's always this set of students who just aren't really technologically inclined and maybe they've never even been on social media. I know that sounds surprising, but it, it does happen. And some of them are not on social media for, you know, very like deep reasons. Like they, they've really thought about it and they just never want to get on, on social media. So, so there was always like some element of needing to make space for those people. And so we always had alternatives for them. But in the in general, like it was a lot of fun. Like people were posting on Instagram, they're able to like each other's posts very easily. It was just generally like, like it worked really, really well. And the, the other thing that was nice about it was we could see like lots of different faculty using it and students could peek in on other classes around the country and eventually around the world who were using it. Um, I'm not sure what the hashtag has on it now. It says, uh, I've just checked it here. It's, it's over 16,000 posts. And so that's kind of fun. You know, people are, are using the, the hashtag and sharing stuff. Well, well, I think the challenge is always like, what's private, what's public, where does it happen? Who has ownership on it? Like, these are things that come up when, whenever I talk to, to people and we've replicated like aspects of this pattern. Like, so like, that's one of the cool things about this one is is you went and you made it something that other faculty members could use with other courses at other institutions so that's like one of those big things to do mm -hmm. and, and comes with some complexity yeah comes with some awesome benefits because like part of this when you say in the world like it's pretty awesome that you can see it happening in the world you know in all these different places but and i think you're going to hit on this now is, is there also kind of some, some repercussions maybe of, of those choices of public? Yeah. And so I think maybe this is the right way to say it is that it's not that we're totally shifting away from Instagram. It's that the emphasis uh, in, in my course, for example, was basically like, let's do this on Instagram, I, like encouraging everybody to do it on Instagram, but there's this backup where you don't have to do it. Um, and you can just do it on canvas, like behind uh, closed doors kind of thing. Um, I think we shifted now to a different sort of weighting of those elements. And now I actually encourage students to do it on canvas and then 
if they want to share it on Instagram, that's just up to them and they can do that if they want to. And a few students do that. The nice thing about that shift is that now all the posts are coming into this sort of private space, this you know walled garden of, of Canvas. And there's a bunch of ways that we can monitor and encourage people to participate there. And for a lot of students, they, they like to have everything in one place, like all their classes in one place. And having to go outside of Canvas feels a little bit um, you know, burdensome. So we're getting a lot more participation by keeping it all inside Canvas. It allows us to, it allows students to kind of have their notifications on Canvas set up in a way that, you know, it's kind of that school space. Um, and they're not like feeling this weird pull where Instagram feels like this non-school space, but then, you know, setting up notifications for this account can get kind of confusing. I think just in general, people are navigating these complex social relationships, you know? Um, and uh, in general, we found that the Canvas thing is working a lot better. Uh, and then some students go out and use Instagram. The upside of that is that the stuff that ends up on Instagram is generally higher quality. It's a little bit less watered down because uh, it's mostly just the really good stuff where students are really wanting to share something. Are you feeling the tension? I'm sorry, Tom. Um, are you feeling the tension with the original idea that you and Ryan had to get this out in the world? And then now yeah. you're back behind, you know, the, the walled garden of Canvas and are you trading Canvas for Instagram or like, it, it's just interesting because it's yeah. almost like the, the, not only evolution of the technology, but evolution of the thinking around how to teach openly. Right, I think, you know, the original idea was also that we wanted to create challenges that were so awesome that lots of people would wanna do them even if they weren't signed up for the class. So we imagined, you know, people doing like the 28 day challenge, which is just, you know, you try to break a habit or create a habit over the course of 28 days, like maybe that's the kind of thing that could go viral on Instagram and people would see this, you know, 28 day challenge, hashtag Ant 101. And then maybe other people would do it just for, just for fun. And, you know, pretty soon we got, the, the idea was we would have people taking the class who aren't really in the class, right? And they're just sort of taking it online, participating when they want to, diving out when they, they don't want to. And we got some of that, but the, the kind of the weird thing is if you look at some of the posts ha that have hashtag Ant 101, uh, you start to, some of it, some of them are low quality. Some of them are even like potentially offensive. And that's where you start to be like, mm, man, I don't know. Like this is, this is tricky. I feel partially responsible for this post that, that is borderline offensive, you know? And, you know, it's, it's one thing to handle that in the classroom and there's certain ways to handle that in the classroom. Uh, it's trickier when it's out in the world. Well, and I think what, what becomes interesting to me is like, it felt like, like, w when did we start this? Like, I don't know. That was a long time ago. It <laughs> yeah. feels like, it's like, almost, yeah, it's like almost five years now, I think. That we, yeah. Yeah. And a lot has happened in five years, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I think like it, it felt, I don't know, more innocent at that point. And yeah. A lot of these things just didn't seem as as conflicted, and I think what what I've done more and more of is is kind of those blended spaces and being able to like push back and forth between, you know, fully private, maybe semi private or at least controlled groups, and then fully public, mm -hmm. um, and and that's what I think is an interesting space for some of this is that you can you can you know if we take Canvas for instance you can decide like we've done embedded WordPress sites within Canvas. So you get the control and visuals of, of something like that. Um, you know, we've knitted Instagram things into Canvas as well, and then done some stuff around pushing content, you know, in and out of that space. So trying to make it once again, that facile ability to kind of move maybe from private in Canvas to public in mm -hmm. Instagram or wherever and creating those mechanisms. So maybe you end up with the best of both worlds without a lot of technical overhead. And I think maybe maybe that's an aspect of the future is, is gradations of public and private and then trying to take advantage of 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 
the services rather than you them taking advantage of us so much. It's interesting too, because one of the things that, and I don't know if it has to do with the network effects of doing the, the what you've done on Instagram or on WordPress, et cetera, was it's become like a media empire, right? Like mm -hmm. you have textbooks free, both, you know, uh, paperback as well as a, a digital edition. You have a film school. Um, you have a whole series of like other faculty at other schools doing Anth 101. And then you have a resource guide for them. Like talk a little bit about what it's been like to build this out um, as a shared course, as an open course for other people to to use and adapt, I imagine, as they see fit. Yeah, I, I think that speaks to kind of realizing like what is best out in public and what is best kept in private. And one of the elements there is stuff that's just really well polished, I'm okay putting out. And this has to do with my own personal media philosophy, which is in general, I try not to consume any media that took less than two days to produce. Um, that's just sort of my own media diet is I like things that are like thoughtful and considered, you know, and so those are books, um, thoughtful YouTube videos, not just like real quick, uh, throw it up there videos. And generally I stay away from social media. So that's kind of how I run the site as well is, is now, you know, I've, I've got the book out there, totally public, totally free uh, in multiple formats. Um, I participate in multiple like faculty groups, some of them, you know, on Facebook, just basic Facebook groups. And then we also have our own sort of private Google group where we share ideas specific, specific to Anth 101. And so in general, like this has been a really fun way to do things for me. I produce videos for the course. And again, those are like, take a long time to produce and, and then they get pushed out. Sometimes those include student work, but that gives me time to sort of contextualize and polish that work before it gets showcased. So it's not just, it's not just like throwing stuff uh, out in out into the world. And I don't know, it sort of can feel like it kind of gunks up the internet <laughs> to, to throw out like low quality work. So that's that's part of the philosophy behind that. So it's like the opposite of DS-106. <laughs> <And that. laughs> well, it's, it's a tricky thing because I love DS-106, you know, and, um, and it, you know, I, the nice thing about the internet, of course, is that it does have these filtering mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But I have been embarrassed on occasion at being someone who's been, you know, an advocate of being out in the open for now for like 15 years. I have been embarrassed on occasion by things that really probably shouldn't have been out in the open. Uh, sometimes they're just like uh, quick lecture notes or something that aren't totally polished, but they include like, you know, non-contextualized information that, that I'm just not, I wouldn't, not super proud to like have my name associated with, you know? And so I've become a lot more careful about, you know, making sure that what gets out there that, that I can vet, like gets vetted well and, and that it's high quality stuff that goes out. Well, that's one of the things I've struggled with though, like real quick is like, how, how do you like demonstrate like this evolution of thought mm. if all that people see is the published piece? You know what I mean? And that's, that's the tricky thing I find with a lot of this is I understand like a lot of the concerns, but I'm also trying to show people like, look, I thought this, then more time and I thought this and like, it's okay and good that these things should evolve and, and continue to improve. Like just to, to demonstrate that better is something that I kind of struggle with. One of the key things that changed with Instagram just in the last five years for us is that more and more people see it as a curated space, not as a social space. And so that's one of the sort of triggers for students is like, oh, shoot, I'm really not comfortable messing with my curated space here, you know? So they, the Finsta thing helps, of course. Um, but, it, but I think Instagram in, in some ways like shifted. And I, there's a whole other layer here where I heard more and more students who had had um, really bad experiences on Instagram that just made it difficult for them to participate on the website at all. I think that plays into uh, some some stuff that's happening with this generation in general, which is it, it, obviously they've 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 struggled through a lot of challenges that we didn't have, um, and the internet is one of those challenges. Just trying to figure out how to navigate it and be in it.
Well, and I well, think maybe that's the, the thing, like everything is getting more complex, <laughs> more enmeshed and more things to think about, which is kind of the opposite of what was promised, right? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. but, but I think it's, it is, it is the deal, right? Like what's private, what's public, what's curated, what's this, what's that? Like all of it blends and merges in ways that, that we're just not seeing. You can't just say like, be in the open. Like this is all good and positive or, and I think at the same time, you can't say like be totally private because you want to be building this reputation. You want to be creating, mm -hmm. you know, this identity in certain ways and, and different people are just going to navigate it. And I guess the technologies and the social implications have only grown more complex. And the courses like this or more broadly higher ed should be a place where that's thought of and navigated through yes. these experiences. And so that really does tie deeply. Well, I, I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation. I enjoy the work you both have done for many a year, but seeing you two work together on Anth 101 is a highlight. And thank you both for taking the time uh, to chat with us about your work. Sure. Thank you. Big fan. <laughs> <laughs> nom, nom, nom.